So horror games are in no way easy to make. It's probably one of the hardest genres to get right. Mainly because it's not just about having interesting gameplay, but more about invoking fear in a player. The player's satisfaction relies heavily on how much tension they feel during the game. Because at the end of the day, people play horror games with the expectation of getting their adrenaline pumping. And if you fall short on that, even if it has decent gameplay, people will still feel dissatisfied with your game. So how do we prevent this? Well, in order for us to fully understand what makes a great horror game, we have to look at all aspects that go into it. So with that said, let's get right into it. Creating a monster or enemy is one of the most crucial steps in the horror genre. It's not an easy task, especially if you want your monster to stand out from the rest. But one thing that can really set you apart is the presentation. And what I mean by this is how you present your monster to the player. Because when it comes to horror, it's not about seeing the monster that makes it so scary. It's your imagination that really takes hold and makes the monster terrifying. And there are many ways to present your monster without actually having to show it. One great example of this is Iron Lung, where you're in a submarine and are forced to venture into the depths of the Red Sea. The only problem is you have no way of seeing anything around you, forcing you to only use coordinates and a camera that captures still images. And while you're going to specific markers on the map, you'll hear strange noises around your submarine. It almost sounds like something huge is circling around you, and throughout the game your radar will randomly go off telling you that you're close to hitting something. And at first you might think it's a wall or a huge rock in the way, but rocks and walls don't just randomly disappear. While you're taking these pictures, you'll see huge bones from creatures that live in the depths of this Red Sea, and you'll catch a glimpse of what they look like from afar in your camera. But at the end of the game, you are quickly attacked and killed by this horrid thing. As you can see here, the monster doesn't have to be shown till the very end, because throughout the game there are only suggestions that something is out to get you. It creates tension within the player because you don't know for sure if you're safe or not. And as the player, there are so many signs that something is off, but you are forced to continue creating fear. And at the end of the game, you get the payoff you need, and are able to release all that tension when you get jump scared. There are many ways to present a monster, there isn't just one way to do things. And that's why it can be a crucial step to setting you apart from others. Another fantastic example is Amnesia The Dark Descent. If you've played through this game, you'll notice that with most of the monsters, you first read or hear about them. Usually you'll learn what damage they've caused or learn about their backstory. Either way, after hearing about them, you'll start seeing them from afar, almost as if it's an hallucination. And after this, you'll finally get confronted by the monsters, forcing you to hide and run away. It's a great formula and Amnesia has definitely made this the norm for horror games, because it's known to work. Another great example from Amnesia is the water monster. It's one of the most iconic monsters in the game, and is still used in games today like Ruin. Part of the reason it was so iconic was because it was such a clever way to present a monster, because you can't physically see it in the water. You can only see the splashes it makes, the destruction it leaves in its path, and the horrifying noises it makes. Subconsciously, your brain is filling in the missing pieces of this monster, using the destruction and noises you hear from it to form an image of what it could look like. And as I always say, nothing is scarier than your own imagination. I also think the game mechanic around the water monster brought it to that extra level, because you can't just hide from it, you have to run and jump on the platforms to prevent yourself from dying. Each platform you run to is a risk, because the monster is right behind you. It's intense, and not just because of the gameplay itself, but because the gameplay complements the monster. And I think this is a huge step, because if your gameplay doesn't fit well with the monster or doesn't make sense, the player will end up feeling the same way. It'll feel as if something is missing from it. One great example is in the Rune DLC. You have the entity mixes trying to stop you from deactivating the security nodes. And because of this, when you're using the security mask, Mixes appears and tries to attack you. This gameplay complements the monster because it makes sense and fits well with the whole game. It feels thought out and doesn't feel random or contrived. Same goes for Choo Choo Charles, a game where your goal is to use the weapons at your disposal and take down a horrific spider-like train. Each weapon has its own purpose, either to slow it down or cause more damage. And along with this, you can hear when it gets closer to you, letting you know that you need to start moving forward. It's a really great game mechanic, and again, the gameplay complements the monster. And to just really help you understand what it looks like when you don't do this, Garden of Banban is a great example. 
The main mechanic in this game is using your drone to solve puzzles by pushing buttons to open doors, but this mechanic never complements the monster at any point in the game. It feels very separated from the monsters, and because of this they don't have a huge impact on what you're doing throughout the game. But I think at this point you get the idea. It's important to have gameplay complement the monster, but that's not the only thing that you can do to make your monster stand out. Another great tool at your disposal is the design of the monster itself. It's easier said than done, but if you do it right, it'll set your game apart from others. When thinking of your monster's designs, it's important to know what you want your player to feel when they see it. Will it hit that uncanny valley? Will it make you feel sad? Or will it make you feel horrified? If you can get that player to instantly feel something from your monster, you're on the right track. Again, Choo Choo Charles is a great example because it's so different and unique. When looking at him, you instantly feel creeped out and horrified. His spider-like legs along with his disturbing rows of teeth along his face. Every aspect of his design is thought out and executed well. Amnesia's monsters are another great example because they fit the feeling of the game. It's horrific seeing some of these monsters and also sad knowing that it used to be human. In Amnesia The Dark Descent you get this feeling of hopelessness and guilt. Silent Hill 2 does this really well too, making the monsters feel out of this world and creepy which is very fitting for a game about a mysterious place called Silent Hill. Another important aspect when designing a monster is taking a look at how readable your monster is. And the best way to do this is by looking at their silhouettes. And you can simply do this by turning a monster into a dark black shadow. That way you can easily see what your monster's silhouette looks like. It helps a lot to have a design that is easily readable because it makes your monster more memorable to players and can enhance the scare factor. The Outlast Trials is a good example of why silhouettes are important. Most of the monsters in the game don't stand out and feel like your basic enemies you'd find in any horror game. That is except for Mother Gooseberry. The reason Mother Gooseberry stands out is because her design is unique and exaggerated, and her silhouette becomes interesting and dynamic because of it. If you ask people that play this game who their favorite enemy is, they'll most likely say Mother Gooseberry because it's such a memorable character. And just to clarify, when I say more readable, I don't just mean how easy it is to see the full figure. It also means as a player, I should know exactly what the monster is about when looking at it. For example, in Five Nights at Freddy's, when you look at the animatronics, you can tell a lot about their character. Boxy has an eye patch and a hook because he's a pirate. Freddy is the main character because he's front and center on the stage. Chica's character revolves around food because she has a bib with Let's Eat on it. This is what I'm talking about when I say make your monsters more readable, because not only does it make your monster more unique, but it adds character to your monsters. Another great thing to keep in mind when designing a monster is changing something that we see every day as normal, because the reason monsters in a lot of our favorite horror games are scary is because our brains instantly goes into a fight or flight response when we see something we're unsure of. That's why zombies and vampires are so popular because they were once human, but aren't anymore. Choo Choo Charles is a great example of this. Combining a train and a spider is just plain genius. Trains are very normal and mundane to some, and most people have seen a train before. But now that it looks similar to a spider, it triggers your brain even more because you know what a train is supposed to look like. And when you see Charles, it instantly puts you off because of how different he is from real life. It's very similar to how you get the uncanny valley feeling. It's when something looks very similar but feels off somehow. Another important aspect to think about when creating your monster is how you want them to act. Do you want your monster to free roam around your levels? Do you want it to be scripted events? Or do you not want to show the monster at all? Whatever you end up doing, it should add to the scare factor or add another layer of depth. Alien Isolation is a perfect example of this. In the game, you're on a ship trying to escape from a horrifying monster. But the cool thing about this game is the advanced AI system. The monster will actively learn as you progress the game. It'll get better at finding you and hunting you down. It adds to the gameplay and makes the monster 10 times more terrifying because you have no idea what this monster is truly capable of. But of course your monster doesn't need to be this advanced to be scary. Again, using Iron Lung as an example, the monsters will periodically be scripted to activate your radar sensor. You don't actually see the monster itself, but for the player it's enough to create tension and suspense. So don't feel like you need to show the monster in your game. Another great example is, again, Five Nights at Freddy's. Each animatronic acts differently and slowly gets more aggressive as the nights go on. 
This makes each night you play harder and harder. And it gets your adrenaline pumping because you have to focus on all of them while managing your power to stay alive. And because of the way the animatronics act in the game, it heightens the fear factor. And that's why deciding how you want your monsters to act is so important, because it'll help you understand what kind of gameplay you want, and how you want to raise up the tension. Either way, whatever you may be working on, it's important to think about how you want to present your monster in a way that stands out. And of course, it's important to take a step back and look at your monster's design and see how readable it is from a player's perspective. And lastly, it's important to have the gameplay complement the monster so that it all comes together to create a truly horrifying experience. But the monsters aren't the only thing that makes a great horror game. Sound design is one of the most important aspects that goes into a horror game. Not many people talk about the importance of sound design, and I think that's partially because it's meant to be in the background for people to subconsciously take in while you're playing the game. It's not meant to be in your face, so it's hard to notice sometimes, but when it's gone, players will most definitely realize the lack of sounds. So with that said, let's take a look at what creates great sound design. Sound design is a huge part of horror games because it sets the tone of the atmosphere and gives your game a sense of identity. Most music used in horror games use the minor scale as well as the augmented and diminished. There's a lot of creativity to be had with the amount of chords and notes at your disposal. And since there are so many ways to create music, it's a sure way to separate your game from others. For example, Amnesia The Dark Descent has an amazing soundtrack that fits the whole story of the game. The music lingers and is drawn out. You can feel the dreading guilt from the music. It's done so well that you start to develop a feeling for the game itself. The music makes the game feel truly alive. And Silent Hill 2 does the same thing by using drawn out synths. It gives you this feeling of being lost in a foreign place. Which is very fitting since you're wandering around a mysterious place called Silent Hill. As you can see here, music is used to provoke more feelings from the player forming a tighter connection between the game and the person playing. And that's why I highly suggest producing your own music for your horror games if you can. But if you are unable to, you can make it up through using sound effects and sound cues. Having a variety of sound effects in your horror game is a huge step to adding tension and making your game feel more real to players. One great example is Summer 58, the very first game I talked about on this channel. This game is one of the best examples of how impactful sound effects are in horror games. Summer of 58 is a pretty normal horror game where you walk around in this little camp in the middle of the woods. But what makes it so special is the amount of details in the sound design. You can hear the wind blowing and the birds chirping outside. Wherever you walk, you'll hear all kinds of groans and creaks from the old wooden floors. And at times, there can actually be too many sound effects going off at once. And that just goes to show how crazy the sound design is in this game. If it weren't for the sound effects, it would just be another mediocre horror game. But it's not, because that's how much sound design can improve a game. There's so much you can do with sound effects, and again, it can give your game an identity and make your game more memorable. Same goes for sounds that trigger during a jump scare. These things are important to think about because it brings up the scare factor depending on what you want to do with them. For example, when you're getting chased in amnesia, the music that is played is a perfect example of how sound effects can make the intense part of your game even more horrifying. The music played when you're getting chased reminds me of a siren that would go off during an emergency. And it's just plain genius because most people associate sirens with something bad, and it can cause stress or fear. So whenever you're getting chased and start hearing the music, it just makes the experience more terrifying. Another cool trick you can do with sound design is quickly taking all the sounds away from the player. And what I mean by this is after a while, players will get used to the background music and ambience. So the best way to prevent your player from getting too comfortable is to quickly take it away. This will leave the player in silence with nothing but their thoughts, which will make them tense all over again. It's a very subtle thing, but if you played a couple horror games, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a very easy tool to keep that cycle of gaining tension and releasing it. Also, don't be afraid to experiment a little with sounds. There's a lot that you can do to subconsciously make people feel off. I think one of the perfect examples of this that wasn't even intended in the game is Minecraft. If you ask around, a lot of people get weirded out when playing Minecraft alone. There are times in the game where you just don't feel like you're the only one there. It's as if someone is watching you from afar. But why do some people get this weird feeling in their stomach? Well, I believe it has to do with the lack of atmospheric sounds in the game. If you played Minecraft, there are times when it can be very silent. 
It's as if the world is dead. The only thing that you can hear are some occasional animals and your own footsteps. And I think the fact that the background music plays randomly makes the silence even louder. Because when you hear the music, you get used to it. It's relaxing. But when it stops, you hear nothing, just you, and it becomes very off-putting to a lot of people. And that just goes to show how much impact sound design can have. Because if you add some atmospheric sounds to Minecraft, people wouldn't be having these strange experiences. Another way you can make people feel off is to have it contradict the game itself. Basically, if you have a scary environment, play music that sounds happy. For example, in Rune, you can hear the Security Breach theme song played at random parts of the game. But what's really cool is the audio is distorted and sounds old, giving this game this old feeling as if it's been abandoned for years. Because when you hear this music, you associate it with the bright shiny colors of what the Pizzaplex once was. But now, when you hear it and see what's left of the Pizzaplex, it gives you this weird feeling. It's very eerie and works really well to keep you tense during the gameplay. Overall, sound design is such an important aspect of horror games, and I think if you take this into account when planning or working on your own game, it can definitely give you an upper hand. Just make sure your background music provokes a feeling and fits your game, and use sound effects to enhance the tension between the game and the player. And lastly, don't ever be afraid to experiment with your sounds. There's a lot they can do with it to make people feel off and enhance the tension within the game. Now that we've talked about sound design, let's go over and take a quick look at how visual design can enhance a player's experience while also creating unity within a game. So when it comes to visual design, there are plenty of styles to choose from to give your game personality. You could give your game an old retro feel that could resemble the PS2 era, or go farther back resembling the 64-bit era. There's a lot of styles to choose from, and partially why I love indie horror games, because they go more out of the way to do something unique. Chila's art and Puppet Combo are perfect examples of what a developer can do to have their own style. Chila's art games are meant to be old Japanese horror games, with details that represent the PS2 era. Puppet Combo's games are also meant to look old, but represent the old horror games from the PS1 to PS2 era in America. Puppet Combo's games tend to feel older because of the clunky controls and the muddy graphics. So even though these two are similar, they both have their own sense of style. And I think that's something to also take into consideration. Whatever style you choose for in your game, you can still find ways to make your games feel unique, even if there are a lot of horror games out there with the same style. You have total control of what you want your game to look like as a developer, and there's a lot of hard choices to choose from. But since this topic is so broad, I'll just give some factors to keep in mind when creating your style. One of the most important things to keep in mind, generally speaking, is to have consistency throughout your game. It can kill a player's ability to be immersed in your game, and that can impact how scary your game ends up being. It's important to make sure your environments and assets all fit to whatever style you're going for. Garden of Banban is a great example of what it looks like when you don't have your whole game adhering to one style. When I went over this game, I mentioned how jarring it was to see low quality models next to high quality ones. It breaks the immersion because it reminds me that I'm playing a game and distracts me from whatever is happening, which can ruin important moments that are trying to build up suspense and tension. Another thing to keep in mind is how much darkness you want in your game. Having darkness is an important part of horror games because it allows players to imagine what could be hiding within it. It gets the player's mind running with ideas, and not being able to see everything at once makes the game more mysterious and exciting. Again, Garden of Bambin is a perfect example of why bright environments tend to not be as scary. It was very rare to be in an area that was dark. Everything was always brightly lit up and left nothing for your imagination to take over. You had nothing to be worried about because you can see everything that is going on from afar. Part of what makes horror games so scary is not knowing when something is going to happen. And it's a lot harder to get that feeling when you can perfectly see everything at a mile distance. Amnesia the Dark Descent is a perfect example of how to use darkness to your advantage. You constantly have to manage the amount of lights around you and the manor was constantly dark and foggy. Sometimes it was so dark that you can only see the shadows of the monsters from afar. It was perfectly executed because it's not overdone to where you can't see anything, and it's not too less where you can see everything at once. Overall, when it comes to visual design, make sure you find a consistent style for your game and be aware of how much darkness there's going to be in it. If your game covers all these bases in visual design, you'll be set to start working on your environments, which is what we'll be talking about next. 
So when it comes to creating your environments, it's very important to take into account what your game is going to be. Because if you have gameplay that doesn't fit to the environment, players will end up getting frustrated rather than getting scared. A perfect example of this is Security Breach. Even though the environments were super detailed and fun to explore, it was still very annoying to go through because the gameplay doesn't complement the environment. There will be times where you are super lost and have no clues as to where you are going, so you end up wandering around in hopes of starting the next objective or triggering the next cutscene. This is a huge break in immersion and totally dilutes the tension the player has. That's why it's very important to have layouts that work with the gameplay in mind. You have to decide if you want your game to be free roam or linear, and it can also be a mix of both if that's what you're going for. Just keep in mind free roam can tend to be harder to make because there's a lot more room for coding mistakes, or for players to outright skip parts of the game. It just really depends on what you're looking for in your own game. Another thing to keep in mind is adding environmental storytelling. This can add a lot of life into your game, keeping the player engaged with what you have to offer. Again, Security Breach is a very good example of this because of the amount of storytelling they have in their environments. You can learn a lot from just walking around the Pizzaplex without any exposition. You get an idea of each room's purpose, you learn more about the lore, and you can instantly tell what the animatronics are about and what they represent. Just like in English class, it's better to show, not tell. Don't explain things about your game if you can show them through your environment, because it can bring a lot more immersion to the player. Little Nightmares does a great job at this by having the player try ideas out, seeing what works and what doesn't. By exploring the environment and using contextual clues, the player will eventually figure out what to do without being told. This is a part of why Little Nightmares is such a fun platformer because you aren't told what to do. Instead, you watch and learn from your mistakes. And as you continue, you get more familiar with this strange world and get sucked into the environment. If you look at a lot of recent horror games or just games in general, there's a huge lack of innovation in ways to teach players how to play the game. Most of the time, you are given a picture of the controls with descriptions of what each button does. And yes, I get some games it's more beneficial to go this route, but for most horror games, if you can try to subtly tell players what to do by using your environments, it really makes your game stand out because at the end of the day, tutorials are immersion breaking and to a lot of players it just isn't fun. So I highly advise using environments in your game to show the player what it's about and what you have to do instead of telling them. Another aspect to environments is having details. The Rune DLC is one of the first games that comes to mind when I think of adding details to your environment. Rune does an amazing job at making the abandoned Pizzaplex feel unalive. You have graffiti, broken ceilings, and walls. You have random debris everywhere you go, and the animatronics are barely working. I mean, there are literal cockroaches around the Pizzaplex. The amount of details it has really helps to keep the gameplay interesting because there's always something to look at. If you can find ways to add details to your environment, it will bring a lot of personality to your game, especially since you have full control of what kind of details you want. The Outlast Trials was another great game that had detailed environments, with blood and gore painted on the walls and floors. Parts of the infrastructure is worn out and falling apart. I mean, each trial you'd go through, it looks as if it's been used for years by Murkoff. It adds a lot to the immersion and makes the game a whole lot scarier. And just to clarify, it doesn't have to be a lot. It can just be furniture or a decoration to fill the empty spaces in your game. That way your environments will feel complete and still be achievable if it's done by one person. Another thing that you can do is use liminal space to make your game feel eerie and off. And if you don't know what liminal space is, it's essentially a space that has a mixture of public infrastructure that you'd usually find filled with people. For example, places like malls, airports, and schools come to mind. It also tends to involve a lot of repetitious patterns or openings and oftentimes can be a long empty hallway. Gary's Mod is a perfect example of liminal space. The maps feel very weird and some of the layouts just don't make sense because they look familiar, but they are off from what you would expect from reality. Which is why it can cause players to feel off, because it's so close to being normal but it's not. Which is very similar to the Uncanny Valley. Many creators have used Gary's Mod to create maps dedicated to giving you that liminal space feeling. And if you want to learn more about the art of creating these types of maps, I'd highly suggest going over and playing some of the maps for yourself. And if you want a deeper explanation, check out the Librarian's channel. He does a lot of videos related to Gary's Mod and liminal space in general, and just talks about how it makes him feel as he's playing, and I think his explanations are far better than I could ever do. With that said, another important aspect is thinking about the purpose of your environments. Again, there are a lot of ways to create environments and you need to make sure you get the ideas and feelings across to the player without it being confusing. 
For example, the convenience store made by Chila's art perfectly captures the fear of working at a gas station or convenience store at night. When you first start the game, you are in an apartment and are told to get ready for work. Once you're all set up, you have to go on this long walk in the dark in order to get to your job. And while you're making your way there, the neighborhood is empty and you hear almost nothing. It's very eerie and makes you slightly concerned, which is a very real feeling of walking alone at night. When you get to the store and start working, you get that feeling that something bad is going to happen. It's midnight, you're alone, and have nothing to protect you. It doesn't help that the convenience store is seemingly placed in the middle of nowhere, with it being the only building outside of the neighborhood. And as you can see here, these feelings and ideas are clearly shown to the player thanks to the environmental layout. It's not an easy thing to do, especially if you've been working on your game for a while, because it can cause you to be numb to the feelings your game is meant to provoke. So it might be best to have people playtest your game to help you get a better understanding of what feelings are being shown by your game. Overall, make sure your environment complements the gameplay and that it's filled with details and environmental storytelling that communicates your ideas and feelings to the player. With that said, we can finally talk about the biggest aspect of a horror game, the gameplay. So when it comes to gameplay, again, it's a very broad topic that can be very different depending on what kind of game you're going for. But no matter what you're working on, you need to be able to create that cycle of building up tension and releasing it. And I think the best game to learn this from is Night Security by Chila's Art. But before I get ahead of myself, we first need to look at the steps needed to create tension within a player. With that said, there are a total of five steps. Setup, Expectation, The Seed of Doubt, Diversion, and then Action. The setup is the background story of the game. It usually involves the player learning and getting comfortable with the environment. This also goes hand in hand with the next step, expectation, which is what the player is expected to do and what the player expects from the game. These two steps are made to allow the player to understand what is normal in your horror game. That way, when we take the rug from under the player, they'll know that this is something out of the norm and off. Which brings us to step three, planting the seed of doubt. Now, this part is crucial and is the turning point for every horror game. This is when you introduce something off that is not seen as normal. It can be small things like lights flickering or random creepy noises, or it can be big events like having blood on the floor or spotting a monster within your gaze. It's usually best if you start with the small things first and slowly crank it up to bigger events to further drive tension within a player. This is when we get to step four, diversion. And here is when it gets interesting. Now that you have the player all riled up, you're going to set up a scenario where the player feels like they'll get attacked by a monster or get jump scared. But in reality, nothing will actually happen, or it'll be something normal in replace of where the player would expect the jump scare. This step is a huge trick on the mind. Players will be bracing themselves, expecting something to jump out at them, which will raise their suspense. But when nothing happens, it causes players to feel relieved for a brief moment before being tense all over again because they know deep down that jump scare will come at some point. When making a horror game, you can use these diversions more than once, but it works the best when you use them sparingly to make it harder for players to know if something will happen or not. And this is when we get to the final step, action, where you finally allow the player to be chased, attacked, or jump scared by the monster in your game. At this point, the player will have an unbearable amount of tension that when you finally jump scare them, it'll leave them petrified. But not only does it leave them petrified, but it brings their tension back down, allowing you to continue this cycle of gaining tension and releasing it through the use of these steps. As you can see, tension is in no way an easy thing to do, but if you can follow these general steps, it'll be far easier to understand what you need to do for your horror game. Now, going back to Night Security, the reason I think it's such a perfect example of all these steps is because the whole game builds up to a jump scare and a chase scene. This game perfectly shows the different steps needed to create tension, it gives you a background story for the setup, it gives you an expectation of the game, it plants the seed of doubt early and in a clever way, and has tons of divergence that makes the player all riled up, and of course, has the action, with you finally getting chased by a horrifying monster. If you would like to learn specifically how this game shows the steps needed for tension, you can watch this video above me where I go into more detail about night security. With that said, once you figure out how to involve these steps of tension in your game, you can start focusing on what game loop you want that'll continuously be fun and interesting to the player. So let's take a look at some games to get an idea of what kind of game loops you can have for your own. The first game that comes to mind is Five Nights at Freddy's because of the simplicity of it. 
I think it's good to remind you that your horror game doesn't have to be this huge AAA experience. Generally, the more restrictions you have, the more likely you're going to make something unique, because you have to get creative in order to stay within those restrictions. And that's part of why Final Fantasy Freddy started out the way it did, with it being a merge between 3D gameplay with point and click controls. Because of the way Scott Cawthon made his game, it became very unique and memorable. The game loop is also very simple and easy to understand. You must fend off the animatronics till 6am using the doors and cameras to aid you, but while you're doing this you also have to keep an eye on the battery power, otherwise you'll fail. Each night slowly gets harder, but when you finish the game you feel accomplished and satisfied. Five Nights at Freddy started out very simple, it wasn't a huge AAA game, just a nice little indie game. And look where it's at now. It's a huge series of games with VR titles, books, and now a whole movie. So don't ever feel like your game has to be this huge complex thing. Just focus on what you know you can do and refine it as much as you can. Another fantastic game is Darkwood. It's an unforgiving survival horror game with RPG and roguelike elements. It's a top-down 2D game where you must survive against the horrifying elements of the woods. What makes the gameplay interesting is seeing how you could improve your chances at survival each time you play through this game. And as you learn, the next playthrough you'll find yourself a lot farther than you were the first time you played. It's a great dark game that has a refreshing take on horror. Ready or Not is another great game where you play as a part of a SWAT team where you infiltrate and extract civilians from horrible yet real events. The gameplay is more of a first person shooter than horror, but part of what makes this game so fun is learning the horrors of what's going on at these places you infiltrate. It shows the dark and messed up side of the world that we don't usually get to see, and it creates a very fun game loop. Little Nightmares is also another great game with a fun game loop. It's a 3D platformer where you must traverse the huge world bigger than yourself by solving environmental puzzles and escaping the horrifying beings that live within this world. It's exciting traveling and exploring the dark and weird world of Little Nightmares, and the puzzles are always fun and engaging, and best of all fit within the game's environment. The puzzles don't feel forced, and the enemies you deal with make for an interesting gameplay. Another great example is Silent Hill 2. You play as James, searching for his deceased wife in a place called Silent Hill. You are forced to traverse the mysterious place and take out any monsters in your way. There are also occasional puzzles that you must solve to continue. Overall, it's a really fun and unique experience that you can't get from most horror games. The atmosphere is spot on, the monsters are disturbing and fun to take down, and just the whole concept of Silent Hill is very intriguing. The reason I continue to play this game is because I want to learn more about Silent Hill and how it works. That's what drives this game loop. But I assume you understand by now. You can do a lot with your game loop, there isn't just one right way to do it. But I think one thing that can really help if you have no clue as to what game loop you want for your own game is to look at others and take notes. That way you have something that you know works and still allows you to have some freedom with your game. Another interesting aspect to think about when working on your game is to think about how you want your camera to work. If you look at a lot of horror games, you'll find that there is more than just a first person and third person camera. You have top down views, 2D slash 3D scrollers, and of course fixed cameras. And I think depending on what you're going for, it can help your game substantially. If you're going for a more classic look, it might be best to go for more fixed camera angles. If used right, fixed camera angles can really help to create mystery and make your player feel claustrophobic. Silent Hill 2 does this really well and makes you on edge because you can't see anything outside the fixed camera. And again, another cool thing that Silent Hill 2 does is how it has the camera super close to the player, making it impossible to see ahead of you or behind you. Again, creating this sense of vulnerability because you can't know for sure if you're running closer to a monster or not. These are important things to think about when creating your game. And to just be clear, you don't need to stick with one camera angle. You can have a mixture within your game as long as it doesn't interfere with the gameplay and cause a player to get irritated with your game. There's a lot that you can do with camera angles in horror games, and it's not talked about enough. You could have your camera quickly zoom in at intense moments to heighten the tension. You could have the camera angle at a fixed position at a random point in the game to make the player feel like they're being watched. One game that comes to mind is No One Lives Under the Lighthouse. In the middle of the game, you'll have a couple of chase scenes with a mysterious monster. But during these, the really interesting thing about them is the camera angle is fixed to what the monster is seeing. And it's just so clever because it hides what the monster looks like and enhances the tension at the same time. It's so unique and I haven't seen a game like that before. 
And if you want to know more about this game, check out this video made by Postra. He's a really cool creator that talks about horror games and really goes into depth, especially with this game. But moving on, the last thing that we need to talk about is the jump scares. Now, everyone has a different feeling towards jump scares. Some find it too much, some find it cheap, and others really enjoy it. I, on the other hand, am one of those people where it's good if it's used sparingly. I look at it like this, if your game is an hour long, you really should only have two to three loud jump scares. When it comes to silent jump scares, however, which are jump scares that are silent and not in your face, you can have however much you need in order to keep tension in your game, because silent jump scares don't work in the same way as regular ones. Silent jump scares allow the player to get startled or disturbed without the player releasing all the tension. This both keeps the player entertained and doesn't allow the player to relax. And something else you should keep in mind is to have creative jump scares. It doesn't always need to be a monster in your face making a loud pitch noise. Jump scares can be intense chase sequences, or they can be strung out to make the player tense for far longer. Jump scares also don't have to show the monster, it could just imply that the monster is close. And I think that's another thing Five Nights at Freddy's does well. Everything before the actual jump scare is just brilliant. You can barely see Freddy, with the only light source being his eyes. You hear the happy song playing in the background before it abruptly stops. Then as a player, you wait in silence, with it feeling longer than it should. And just when you start to get comfortable in the darkness, you get jump scared. As you can see, there are multiple steps that make the jump scare so impactful. It's drawn out as much as possible to create more tension and to create more fear. This is what I'm talking about when I say make your jump scares more complex. Try to avoid making them simple. This will make your game memorable and make it far more entertaining to players. But overall, if you apply everything that we talked about today, your horror game has a far better chance of being successful and selling. Remember, there are a lot of horror games out there, so you have to make sure yours stands out. With that said, if you enjoyed this video, hit the bell icon so you don't miss out on future videos like this one, and feel free to join the Discord server where we all come together and share our passion to create and talk about all things horror. So with that said, see you next time.